it's a beautiful thing too. Uh. Hold up. Yay. All right, let's talk about AEW uh, Rampage, <laughs> in which WWE writes the storylines, apparently. Um, cause if you're, <laughs> we'll get into that in a minute. September 17th, 2021, Butcher and the Blade lose to Lucha Brothers because of course they do. Uh, at one point, Penta's mask was tied to the bottom rope, um, which is an interesting spot. Phoenix had to fight Butcher and the Blade by himself. Penta sacrificed his own mask, taking it off so he could help his brother. Um, Phoenix, um, hits, I think a hurricane or something like that for a pin. HFO come out there and jump the Lucha Brothers and Santana and Ortiz make the save. I don't care about any of this. Um, hopefully Santana and Ortiz versus the Lucha Brothers. We get out of it. We get that out of this. Uh, that's my hope and my prayer. I don't think so though. I don't think so. I really like, uh, Santana and Ortiz and the Lucha Brothers. They can be good when, uh, they have good opponents, but they very rarely have good opponents. You know, I find myself tuning out in their matches quite often because it just seems like they just do everything they know how to do in one match. Not quite young buckish, but pretty close. Um, okay, so they show a package for Omega and Danielson, to which WWE wrote this storyline. So um, Omega says, "You were the underdog over there. Then you you come here. You're the underdog again. Everyone who comes through those doors targets me because they realize that I'm the top talent." Daniel Brian Danielson says that he wanted his first match to be the toughest guy in AEW. He heard that guy was Kenny Omega. And that there's been people miss a lot of misconceptions about him. He's going to show people the real Brian Danielson. It's going to be great for the fans, but it's going to be really bad for the AEW wrestlers. So we're not going to have any heat going into this match. This match is going to be, uh, they're really hoping that you are just interested in the physical exercise of Brian Danielson and Kenny Omega being in the same ring. Because the idea of making this something interesting, they just decided, no. We're going to base this off of uh, Brian Danielson was positioned as being the underdog in WWE. We're going to show that he's not, that he's really the American Dragon. And um, I just say to myself, like, eh? Like, okay, if you say so. The reason why he was positioned as being the underdog is because he's one of the smaller guys on the roster. Now he's about the same size as your world champion. He's about the same size as most of the guys on the roster. I wouldn't think that would uh, change too much. Um, but it is a very interesting conception that, you know, we want to show who he really is, quote unquote. And uh, essentially, is that going to bury your world champion? I don't know. That's the only intrigue into this match is the post match. Who, who, who wins? And how bad is it? <laughs> you know, like, does Kenny Omega just straight up tap out to Brian Danielson, that cattle mutilation in the middle of the ring, gets embarrassed, and then now we see that he's not the underdog anymore. He's the big fish in a small pond. And uh, then what? You know, I don't know. And then if he loses, then you show me that he probably really was the underdog and he should have stayed that. So, WWE wrote this storyline. That's one of two. Anna Jay and the Bunny, who cares? Um, Ford knocked out Anna Jay and take Conti with brass knuckles. I mean, you would think that if a girl got hit in the face with brass knuckles, her jaw would be broken or something like that. Um, but, you know, this is woman, women punching women. I don't know why the women have brass knuckles and the guys are hitting each other in the head with iPads and stuff. Like, this, just oof, man. A whole lot of oof. All right, the vignette for Hobbs and Punk was actually pretty good because Hobbs talked. You know, he said that I'm not Darby and uh, <laughs> this is what you've been away with for seven years. Maybe you should have stayed gone for another seven. So that was very interesting. I like that. Hobbs and Punk, my boy. You're my boy, Hobbs. Um, Matt Hardy and Tony Schiavone was in the ring. Uh, Matt Hardy swore that uh, Anna Jay was going to pay and that Proud and Powerful was going to pay. And that fan who was cosplaying Orange Cassidy because cosplay is a real, real big thing in AEW. Uh, was pissing him off for he because he was cosplaying Orange Cassidy. So he goes out there to confront the guy, pulls the fat guy over the railing. I mean, and then he, he throws him into the ring. Fat guy gets stomped by Hardy and... I mean, security just going to let this guy snatch a fan from the crowd and bring him into the ring, right? 
<laughs> oh, uh, security is just kind of like, hey, man, <laughs> we're supposed to be security. It's supposed to be securing both the wrestlers and the fans. Anyway, uh, Jack Evans and Matt Hardy put the, put the boots to him. Then the guy made sure he was, you know, the, the hair wasn't in his face as they cut his hair with his ponytail with uh, scissors. Then they took some clippers to the rest of his head. Then Orange Cassidy came out to absolutely no reaction. Absolutely no reaction. Absolutely no reaction. And then there was a smattering after he ran off Hardy and, and um, Jack Evans. I mentioned he had no reaction. The same reason I mentioned Cody didn't have a reaction on Wednesday. These two used to be some of the most over guys on the roster. And now people don't care about them. Like, don't care about them at all. And um, that's becoming a recurrent thing I've noticed in AEW, especially when it comes to these Rampage shows. Now, some people could say, well, the audience is burnt out, which is entirely possible. The audience could be burnt out, you know, because these are taped after Dynamite. But you would think if this guy was a big star, people would care. And after all the news articles telling me that Orange Cassidy was one of the biggest draws that they have, and he was one of the biggest merchandise movers, and he was a top star and all that shit, here it is. He's in a feud with Matt Hardy and not getting any reaction. I don't know. They're cutting each other's hair. They're cutting off the hair of people and getting no reaction. I don't know. I don't I don't get it. That's weird to me. Then the second WWE written storyline, Britt Baker and Ruby Soho. So Britt Baker gets in the ring and hugs Tony Schiavone again. Of course, this was actually neat because it proves that Britt Baker, who saw Adam Cole talk trash about Tony Schiavone, she didn't care. You know, Tony Schiavone is her friend. Eventually, it's going to come to... It's going to come to a head. And guess that's what when, uh, Britt Baker's going to turn babyface. It's going to be Adam Cole is an insecure jerk. And um, she's going to go and be the strong, independent woman that don't need no man and can do her own thing. And they're not going to, quote, break up. But she's going to probably tell him off in the middle of the ring or something like that about trying to pick her friends for her and everything. But um, it's also probably going to mean that Tony Schiavone is probably going to get super kicked or something stupid like that. But then Ruby came out, and uh, <laughs> we get into the, the back and forth. Britt Baker says that Ruby doesn't know who she is, and that she's been desperately trying to fit in, changing her name, changing her hair color, getting new tattoos. And um, Ruby says, okay, well, yeah, everybody knows who you are because you shove it down their throat. I know exactly who I am. I just never had the freedom to prove it. Which got them <laughs> next to Britt Baker actually being introduced because she's one of the top five of people who are not within the last three months coming into the company. She is probably the most over. I think she's more over than Kenny Omega. Like Brian and Punk are definitely more over than she is. I think she might be more over than Moxley. Britt Baker is really over as far as AEW originals. She's very over. She might be the most over. Uh, but saying that, the first time Ruby mentioned WWE, got one of the bigger reactions of the evening. That's when people woke up and was like, yeah, I, I never had the freedom to prove it. Then she says that Britt Baker is just like every girl she's ever met, entitled, self-centered, and banging some dude in the back. And that got an uproarious reaction uproarious reaction uh Britt baker then told her you call yourself the runaway but you didn't run away you got fired which i got another pretty good reaction to which ruby says yeah you're right i did get fired but it's the best thing that happened to me because it got me here right now and uh she said some other stuff and then they, they scrapped a little bit and Britt baker ran away or well, she slid outside the ring then the invisible wall happened the invisible wall, meaning that she just decided not to chase Britt Baker. Usually they put a physical barrier in between them. They'll just leave the ring. That means the ropes are there. So it's not quite the invisible wall. It's the ropes. So, so in any event, um, we get a lot of stuff. You get WWE never let me be who I am, which, you know, like I say, Ruby didn't really get much of a chance to be her. So she never really got a chance to talk. So I could give her some credit for this. She didn't really get a chance to talk. They didn't delve into her backstory, her personality, her character, anything. I've talked about this before. Um, Ruby is such a blank slate 
And that's actually a big problem with this whole ordeal is she is such a blank slate. Why is her and why are like I know that you can't really avoid that she was in WWE, but like why is every dig at her involving WWE? It should like is that the only thing she's ever done? Because if that's the only thing she's ever done, that's what everything I know that's what everybody knows her for. But if that's the only thing she's ever done, then that's why she got fired in the first place. Because I mean she has <laughs> zero personality, zero interests, and after this match. Chances are she's not going to beat Britt Baker. So after this match, what are they going to do with her? Because once you did all your WWE jokes, now what? You know? Now, uh, I saw a a snowflake, um, blue check mark. was pretty upset about Ruby's uh, um, comments about uh, women banging male wrestlers in the back. But I... I kind of, I shrugged on it. It was kind of brutal. You know, it was pretty good. I would think that would have caused you to at least slap somebody. And that's kind of the problem I have with the dueling promos is that sometimes people say stuff to each other in these dueling promos that would elicit a physical reaction, especially if you were a heel. You know, somebody disrespecting you like that, you would smack them, you know, cheap shot them and run or something like that. That's what I like so much about the Big E uh, Apollo Cruz feud when um you know it was when Apollo Cruz just spazzed out and smacked Big E that time like that was awesome you know <laughs> like he was it's like fuck this dude who are you talking to you know we need to bring that back we need to bring back that energy we shouldn't even got to this whole point of you got fired it should have been you know soon as she says entitled and banging some dude in the back Britt Baker should have threw a punch and maybe even Ruby could have dodged it, threw a punch of her own, and then Britt Baker ran. Or whatever. You know, but it was a good line. It was a solid line. But the WWE guys, it's just been that they were in WWE. It's a storyline. Because it's like, they're, whatever they were doing in WWE, they're just porting that into AEW. And that becomes their storyline. You know, I was never allowed to be myself. I was really the underdog. They treated me like an underdog. That's not who I am. Which is, you know, that's a paraphrase of what Brian Danielson was saying. Now, the main event, we got Fuego Del Sol and Miro. I'm going to skip the promos because who cares? Well, actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to talk about Miro's promo. Because he says the only reason he doesn't care about the car, the only reason he took this match is because he enjoys celebrating with his God up high and his wife below. Yes, sir. A nice, that was a nice one. That was nice. <laughs> they got that deserved the pop of the evening. Okay, so Fuego Del Sol, who is apparently from Alabama, and I don't know, like maybe I didn't pay attention to this when I seen him wrestle before, but he's a redneck luchador. Why couldn't you kayfabe where the guy is from? Just kayfabe where he's from. Like, say he's from Texarkana or something. That sounds Mexican. Like it's not Mexican, but it sounds Mexican. It sounds Mexican enough. Like, don't tell me you got a luchador from Alabama. I don't believe it. Okay. Um, kayfabe. Kayfabe. It's a real thing. Anyway, uh, Miro just plain wins. He gets the car keys. He shoves the car keys into his mouth and puts them in the game over. I called it the accolade on my notes by mistake. Um, Sammy Guevara comes down there to make the save. They tease Sammy Guevara challenging for the TNT title. And uh, Miro ran off. I know, you know, booking one on one, the heel runs off from the baby face, regardless of the size of the baby face. But it's hard for me to look at Sammy Guevara, who looks like a 15 year old boy running off a full grown man in Miro. It just makes no sense to me. I mean, he literally just demolished Fuego Del Sol. Fuego Del Sol is around the same size as Sammy Guevara. They're also around the same age. Um. So it would have been nice if they would have just done something where Sammy could have bumped him. You know, even if he just had to come in there with a chair in order to run him off, that would have been so much better. So the idea of Sammy Guevara being the guy to beat Miro for the TNT title, I thought about it. I said it might be a good story because, you know, you do have that Miro has embarrassed Fuego Del Sol, who is his best friend. It's a good story. The problem is Sammy Guevara has been on the, has been doing what? for the last four months 
he's he's what's one match maybe, and I think he might have been at the pay per view. Was pay per view was four months ago, right? Uh, maybe probably not that long, but he hasn't really done much of anything on television to warrant getting a title shot. And I know that doesn't matter because the TNT title is apparently it's like uh it's like a uh, Afro Samurai. Anybody can challenge number two, but only number two can challenge number one. Well, that's not even true anymore because you can just come from WWE and challenge number one. But you know, I guess there's no ranking system for the TNT title. You can just you know show up and win that. But in any event, I wouldn't be too upset about Sammy Guevara winning, even though I don't like him, because it would make sense in the storyline that uh, he is avenging his friend. It would make it wouldn't make sense to me because. For starters, I don't see why Miro would lose to Sammy Guevara. He's a child. But there's also the situation of who would beat him. There's only children on the roster. You know? So you really got two options. Really, three. You got Sammy. You got Jungle Boy, who is even smaller. He's shorter than Sammy. But he's probably got more weight to him than Sammy. And, of course, you got, like, MJF or, you know, somebody like that. Uh, I think if you're going to beat Miro head up, uh, you need somebody with some size to him, but you don't got anybody. There's no baby faces with any size to them other than Brian Cage, and they don't seem to be interested in pushing him, and I'm not interested in seeing him. So, I don't know. I don't know. So, Sammy Guevara it is. Sammy Guevara is going to be the guy that's going to beat Miro for a TNT title. Uh... Then what do you do with Miro? Because he doesn't have any real storylines, you know. You, which is that after the story, after the the um, the TNT title, you're gonna bring in. That's when you're gonna bring in Lana. Which um, you know, maybe that'd be a good way of keeping him relevant, at least for a little while until people get tired of her. But this this show is a throwaway show. I really, really, it means nothing. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel, donate to the channel. Thank you guys for your time, and I will talk to you guys later, man. Peace out. Old non-aggression. Once that lesson sets in, you'll see a session. But you got an affection for no progression. Regression. The